and want to reinforce um, you know, all the parents being here on time. I'll okay, start by introducing important. myself. Um, my name is Magdalena Buchak and I am a senior staff psychologist at Cognitive Behavioral Consultants. Um, we have an office in White Plains and two in the city. Um, it's a little bit of a mouthful, but I am a cognitive behavioral therapist as well as a dialectical behavior therapist. And I also provide parent-child interaction therapy for children under the age of seven and their parents. Um, and I am also a licensed school psychologist. And so my background is in the school system. Um, and that informs the work I do consulting to various school districts um, in the Westchester uh, area. So I've been working with the Pelham School District now, um, I believe this is already like my third year consulting to their therapeutic support programs, um, as well as now transitioning um, to discussing more like universal social emotional supports um, for students in schools. So heavy on the emotions, heavy on the social interactions, because it all really affects our kids' um, academic functioning. So today, um, what I'll be talking about is how to support your families, right? Like not just your kids, um, but thinking more so from a family perspective on how to um, support each other through transitioning back to school in person after um, over a year, a tough year it's been. So um, for those of you who are joining, uh, feel free to chat any questions or raise your virtual hand. Um, I might not be able to see everyone as I go through the slides, um, but Julia will be monitoring for questions. Overall today, I'll be starting by talking a little bit about uh, anxiety, worry and uncertainty and thinking about what it is, what's typical um, from an emotional standpoint um, in this pandemic, what might not be typical and can be causes of concern, and what can we do about emotions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about strategies and self-care for both you and your kids. We'll talk a little bit about communication and how to effectively communicate to your kids about anxiety and uncertainty and thinking about how to cope ahead um, and support your kids through this transition of being fully in person as it, you know, really there is a lot of uncertainty and uh, we'll talk primarily how to address certain stressors that might make this transition a little bit easier. So overall kind of the conceptualization that I want you to keep in mind is that our emotions and thoughts uh, really impact our behavior, right? And all that can be um, both, uh, um, can be escalated through our bodily sensations, right? Because our emotions are connected to how our body experiences them. And key to kind of keep in mind is our fight or flight system. So in the past year, we've been experiencing a heightened experience of a lot of different emotions and uncertainty. And so, you know, when we're thinking about worries, we're thinking about like cognitively, what is crossing our minds that is concerning us? It escalates our anxiety, which can present in the way our body is experiencing um, the anxiety. So either we really want to retreat and avoid, so flee the situation because of the stimulus. Um, and the, it also can cause us to actually kind of get into fight mode um, because of the adrenaline associated with experiencing strong emotions. This is, of course, going to really impact how we behave, how our kids behave. So really important to kind of understand that perspective as we go into this conversation about emotions. So I think more and more the media is catching up with the realities of how the pandemic has impacted mental health, especially for parents, um, as well as our kids. Um, seeing so many more articles and research started, studies starting to examine what is this looking like from an emotional uh, functioning standpoint. So not only are we seeing such an impact 
on parents, right? So here, you know, a stat that stood out to me in this article is that 63% of parents that they felt that they had lost emotional support during the pandemic, right? So not having that emotional support is going to impact, you know, how we behave both like in all the various hats that we have to um, keep on and switch multiple times a day. And now we're starting to examine the emotional functioning of kids in the pandemic. And this one really stood out to me because it took a look at five, six, seven year olds. So kids as young as that, right, are, are already starting to endorse, you know, having, you know, feeling a lot more on edge and experiencing anxiety. So I can imagine, you know, for kids who, you know, understand less that the older they get and the more information they get flooded with, that anxiety and uh, an understanding of that sense of uncertainty is only going to amplify how they're experiencing everything that's going on around them. So to start kind of thinking about what are your concerns in this transition? I know some parents have um, sent in some of the concerns and we've been seeing kind of themes of what's gonna happen, uh, you know, in terms of social functioning. Middle school is, you know, the it includes so much social um, tension, social experiences, um, figuring things out socially. And now we're kind of amplifying it by having experienced like a year of significant isolation, followed by now um, transitioning back to school. So questions around the status of certain relationships, um, what that's going to look like, right? How are our kids going to interact with each other at lunch, at recess? So we're hearing a lot of social concerns in this transition, along of course, kind of in the realm of worrying about safety, health and safety, understanding what are the increases in the likelihood that I might get sick, that a teacher or somebody I know might get sick. And also the stress of uncertainty, right? And that goes, you know, for the school system as a whole, um, as well as from a parental perspective of like, all right, so we're back in school, but that doesn't really decrease the chances of me and my whole family and everybody else potentially needing to quarantine last minute. So as you know, we go through some of the next slides, think about any questions, again, any new concerns that might be popping up. I'll try to kind of connect some social themes, some worry thoughts around getting sick as we talk about how to communicate about feelings and worries surrounding those topics. So I, the thing that becomes a little bit challenging as we you know, discuss what transitioning looks like is that we've never experienced a transition like the one that we're experiencing now. So a lot of what we're trying to look at is from the lens of potential differences, right? Sometimes I, I think it is a little irrational to think that um, our, we expect our kids to function similarly as this was pre-pandemic times, you know, let's say transitioning from summer to school in the fall. So we might actually be noting some differences in behaviors and emotional functioning that might not necessarily be cause for concern because these are some common reactions that we can see in our kids. So we can see an increase in separation anxiety. And this doesn't necessarily mean just from US parents, but can also um, mean for like from teachers, especially if they do have to experience some changes in staffing. So some worry thoughts about that. Um, so we might see some changes, like some things, you know, that maybe developmentally might be a little off. I know, um, some tweens have started to experience, um, increases in nightmares or actually asking parents, you know, to co-sleep together or difficulties like sleeping through the night. So we see a lot of, um, challenges around sleep and bedtime as well as waking up in the morning. And I'll talk a little bit about, treating that as a vulnerability um, later on in the presentation. Definitely an increase in physical complaints or new fears, right? So new fears might be social fears, totally understandable given how many, like lack of social experiences we've had over the years, um, increases in headaches and stomach aches, or even just 
trying to distract by identifying new ailments or perhaps even um, asking questions about, you know, am I sick? Is this, is this a sign that I am sick? So a lot of reassurance seeking around being sick can be a potential totally normal um, reaction to the situation. Asking questions about death and dying. You know, I, you know, the, the most, the scariest thing that I see is, you know, the numbers right on in the news, as we see, as this continues to affect people worldwide, having more difficulty with authority. So this might not be kind of uh, commonly like discussed, but it is totally common for kids to become more oppositional in a transition where stress might be, uh, might increase. So, you know, going back to that fight or flight system that we have, not everyone is going to try to flee when feeling anxious. We might actually see an increase in externalizing behaviors. So increased conflict, uh, maybe, you know, difficulties following your directions, difficulties following directions in school, which is very atypical, you know, for a student and all of a sudden they're not listening to the teacher. Very common. Overreacting to criticism. So kind of, again, thinking about being in that heightened hypervigilant state because of stress and, and, you know, continued anxiety during this time, you know, kids might be more sensitive. So perhaps, you know, a, a simple corrective comment from a teacher at school might actually lead to a lot of dis, uh, emotion dysregulation when they come home, or we might even see it start to present at school as well. Being more jumpy. So again, that heightened physiological state is what we're also seeing, um, you know, is many reactions that kids are experiencing throughout this whole year actually, you know, are very close to uh, close symptoms to trauma responses. So that it makes sense why they might feel a little bit more jumpy showing less trust in others. So again, it can be both um, a factor of being socially isolated and not necessarily navigating their social relationships um, in the same way in the past year can lead to a lot of relationship disruptions and an increased desire for screen time, right? Uh, you know, screen time, whether it's video games or, you know, social media, making TikToks, all that makes sense because that is a distraction from reality. So it is a lot easier to make a request from screen time than to experience really tough emotions um, or sit with your concerns. What is might be typical for you as parents at this time? It is very similar to the list that I just went through for kids. You might notice less motivation within yourself, increased irritability. So we might be more vulnerable to snapping at our kids, followed by feeling guilty for snapping at our kids, increases in sadness, increased anxiety and worry, feeling more tired, loss of disruptions in sleep, um, and changes in appetite, which you can also see in kids as well, right? Sometimes when we stress, we might not have an appetite. Sometimes when we're stressed, we might overeat or have, uh, you know, a desire to kind of snack a lot. Um, there's difficulty concentrating. So when we experience, uh, you know, flooding of worry thoughts or heightened emotions, that really does impact our ability to stay focused on a task. And, uh, you know, this goes without saying the increase in physiological distress, headaches, stomach aches, um, all really common stress responses. So as we kind of think about what are typical reactions, I want to honor all the emotions that make sense as we live through in this pandemic, right? I, you know, I think, you know, many of us start to kind of hear these new things as like living in the new normal, um, you know, the, the end goal hopefully isn't, you know, the pandemic being the new normal. So I'm just going to like treat it as in the present moment where we are right now, still in this, all of this makes perfect sense. So sadness and anxiety are normal part, normal parts of human experience, existence, right? We experience a wide range of emotions. Now what's challenging is that we might more frequently experience these emotions. So children do have a lot to, you know, feel sad about, feel anxious about, feeling disappointed, whether it is about missed sports experiences or, you know, birthday parties that they didn't have in the past year. 
And right, it's also okay to feel really excited as we transition back to school. All emotions make sense right now. So I just want also for everyone to keep that in mind because that's going to be really helpful as we talk about validation. So kind of continued themes that we may, might begin to you know, see you know, as our students go back to school is even though they might be more exposed to you know, friends and classmates and people, they still might feel isolated. Um, they might miss their normal, more typical routines, uh, might have difficulty following the new rules imposed at school, might have more complaints about those new rules, whether it's changes in lunch, changes at recess, all that makes sense. You might hear some worry thoughts about whether or not we will go back to normal. So we'll talk a little bit about how to handle those uh, concerns. Worrying about health and safety of family members, continue, definitely a continuation of that. Con, uh, worry thoughts about contracting COVID, spreading it to others, uh, such an incredible com common theme. And this can be tied to also behaviors that we might see. So now that there is, you know, potential for uh, increased exposure, you might begin to see, you know, um, requests to make sure that everyone is washing their hands and disinfecting and being really uh, in tune to those behaviors. Again, with a positive emotions theme, like not everyone has to express, like experience worry during this time. There might be feelings of excitement, right? About seeing loved ones, friends again. Now that vaccine uh, rate redistribution is going up, continued uncertainty, right? Even now, as we go back to making attempts at routines that were more common um, pre-pandemic, there is still a lot of uncertainty and we definitely wanna honor that. Um, validate that as much as we can. So all these are going to be commonalities or, you know, things that will totally be normal reactions during this time. What to begin to be mindful about is as we think about the timeline for noticing some of these um, potential reactions is, you know, anything that will last longer than about three, four weeks after you first begin to notice this will start to kind of be indicative of a potential um, concern for which, for which to reach out to your um, school mental health staff or reach out to community resources for extra support. So we're looking at, you know, if it begins to last longer um, than, you know, that month time period, then that will be cause for concern. We're, we're thinking about this as having a little bit more wiggle room, right? Like typically, you know, for adults or outside of this, you know, in the, this time of high stress, we would be looking at like two, three weeks of noticing these symptoms and then it, you know, potentially intervening with them. I think it makes perfect sense to allow children to transition and allow for, you know, them, you know, getting acclimated to in this transition a little bit longer. You know, some uh, childhood diagnoses um, don't get diagnosed until we've seen symptoms for about a month after during a transition. So, you know, typically we see this like the month of September um, as children transition back to school. But other things to be mindful about are really like signs of depression. So if you're starting to see, you know, complete social withdrawal and lack of interest in activities, significant academic declines, not engaging in school. So this might look like continued um, school refusal, right? So seeing a pattern, a consistent pattern of that um, increase in self-criticism. So of course, you know, for the first couple of weeks, if, you know, kids make mistakes or have difficulty completing school tasks, hearing certain statements like, wow, I'm so stupid, or I'll never catch up, I'm a terrible student, those can be common. But if we kind of see that well past like a month, that might be um, cause for concern. I think also um, in this list of causes for concern is if that you're seeing this sadness, uh, withdrawal, but also within the family, significant changes like in appetite, that would definitely warrant um, intervention. Curious, any questions about any of these potential red flags to look out for? Okay. 
So obviously, if there is heightened anxiety, there is going to be an urge to avoid. And avoidance is common in the realm of school. So thinking about, you know, so much of what we experienced in the last year was actually, you know, avoidance was rewarded, right? Like not going places, you know, we were told that it is safer to avoid. So now unlearning that is going to be a challenge. So it is going, you know, seeing urges to avoid are going to be common. Maybe you might see some protests about attending school. But what we want to be really mindful about is chronic avoidance and really being careful of not reinforcing the avoidance. So um, I'll touch on that at a later slide when we talk about reinforcement. So bottom line, and context is super important. We are still operating in crisis mode. Um, your school is operating in crisis mode. You guys as parents are operating in crisis mode. There's a lot, right? And this truly is akin to what it's like to be in a chronic traumatic stressor, such as a war. Um, and, you know, we do have strategies that can help mitigate some, some of this impact to keep in mind. So even though there's a lot that we can't control, there are some things that we'll be able to problem solve together as um, as issues arise. So there actually are some things that you can do, right? And it really does start with you as parents and, and how you model adaptive coping. So I can imagine, you know, whether or not you, um, you know, are working from home or transitioning back to going to work or, you know, still uh, managing so much stress, um, being a homemaker, it has been such a challenging year. So as we think about, just talk to Aaron Ginsburg. Oh, as yeah. we think just about this transition, mm -hmm. I want us to think about that our natural inclination as parents is to be problem solvers, right? Is to make things happen, try and fix things. If something's going wrong with our kid, we want to nip it in the butt real fast. The potential con of doing that is that we often miss opportunities to talk about feelings, about emotions. So the foundation in, in this transition back to school and in still dealing with so much uncertainty and so much uh, worry is focusing on emotions. So my first tip is to try and talk about feelings as a family and consider a potential emotional family check-in. Ideally, this would be daily, right? It doesn't have to be super intense and long and dragged out, but you know, thinking about like one to five minutes to intentionally welcome and accept emotional experiences. Now, understanding tweens, middle schoolers, you might not necessarily get them really engaged in talking about feelings, but the key here is really to ask yourself the same questions and to talk about your own experiences from the day. Maybe you were experiencing, you know, worry and anxiety about your kid being in school. Talk about it. Label those emotions. Label worry thoughts, right? The challenge with thoughts is that we often treat them as facts, right? So, you know, let's say if I had the thought, you know, the world is a dangerous place. Sometimes if that enters my mind, I treat it as a fact when, you know, in reality, it's just a thought, right? Because our emotions are really, really high, our minds are going to really make us believe lots of different irrational beliefs. So if we can practice talking about like, wow, like, you know, something that popped into my mind today was, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I saw something on the news and it really made me feel worried, right? So discussing that, noticing like, wow, today, this Monday, following this weekend, like I woke up with, you know, my stomach hurting. Talk about this, right? Model increasing our attention, paying attention to these things. So this can be, you know, asking out, you know, out loud, what are you feeling today? You know, after school, asking what went well today, honoring an opportunity to talk about what was hard. 
how strong was your sadness today? You know, you can insert any emotion here. I think, you know, in a time when things are still very much off, I think the hardest emotion to talk about is sadness. Invite it. Invite it over for dinner, right? When we're talking about acceptance of emotions, we want to make them a part of the conversation, even when it comes to talking about challenging information, uh, to challenging emotions. Where do you feel in your body that you're worried, that you might be concerned? A lot of kids lack the awareness and the connection between how their body feels to what emotion they might be feeling. So the more that you can model it and talk about it, the more aware they will be, okay? So as we think about opening the conversation up to emotions, if your kids do bring up some emotions, my number two tip is to validate, right? So validation is an acceptance of the emotion in that moment to honor that what you're feeling, what you're thinking, what your behavioral urge might be makes perfect sense, is accurate, is acceptable. So rather than trying to change what, you know, our kids are thinking about, you know, I know that, you know, very often our natural urge, right? If somebody is saying like, well, you know, I'm really worried that I might get sick. Well, if we look at the statistics or we look at the likelihood, or if we look at all the precautions that your school has taken to not get you sick, that starts to challenge that worry and it misses the emotion. So what we wanna do is really sit with that feeling. Wow, like that makes a lot of sense that you're feeling worried about getting sick. You know, when you think about that, right? What else do you think about? How do you feel when, you, when that thought about getting sick crosses your mind? Talk about what they bring up listen, ask them more questions, right? Like, how do you feel about going back to school? You know, or for anyone who is still, you know, remote, how do you feel about staying remote? Is there anything that you're worried or concerned about? Bring in also a little bit of the excitement. I know, you know, so often, especially in the 2020, like we were really like prone to just talking about negative feelings. It's okay to validate positive emotions as well. You know, and also express your worries, model to discussing your worries, right? You can say like, I'm nervous about the first couple of days, right? Because transitions are hard and I'm also excited, um, you know, that you're going to get to spend time with your friends. So even modeling for yourselves, like having multiple emotions is totally okay too. So more examples on like things to validate, right? Validating the big picture that, you know, we are still in the midst of a pandemic and, you know, there is this uncertainty because this, you know, hasn't happened like this. Um, it is normal to feel more anxious. We can honor, you know, like if we hear complaints about how things are different for lunch and for recess not being the same, you know, validating that is really hard to follow all these new rules and get, you know, used to being compliant or, you know, not doing things the way that they used to be. All this makes perfect sense. So we're just emphasizing how much of their experiences make sense are totally understandable, given everything that they're going through. Um, opening also the door up for grief and mourning of how things used to be. Um, you know, I think for many of you, like, you know, for sixth graders that like, this is you know, the first time that they're experiencing, right, they're like middle school building. So honoring whatever that might open up for them, wishing that things were different, right? We can all honor that we too wish that things were different. So any statements of, again, accepting what their experiences will be very validating and just sitting with that. We don't always have to then jump in and, uh, work on changing their worry thoughts or getting them to think and feel differently. We definitely want to lay the foundation of honoring what is. Any questions about validation or how to talk about the emotions? Awesome. So some things that we can actively change and think about changing is around reducing vulnerabilities. So when we think about vulnerabilities or things that make us more susceptible to strong emotions and can impact our behavior, 
really is thinking about sleep, screen time, what we eat, how many positive experiences uh, we have. And so what we want to target, especially given that a lot of us have experienced so many disruptions in sleep is considering changing up the family wind down routine at the end of the day and really being consistent. So I'll give some examples on the next slide of how to do that. Limiting screen time. Now this doesn't necessarily, you know, mean limiting um, just like, you know, their fun screen time, but also like just like really being mindful of news exposure in this transition. I know sometimes just like hearing a snippet of something can make us more on edge. So, you know, if you do consume the news together as a family, just making, checking in with our kids in terms of how they're feeling about what they might've heard or elaborating a little bit on a news story to help them understand the facts. Definitely would recommend limiting screens at least one hour before bed as it, you know, it is shown to impact melatonin production and can really impact the ability to fall asleep. So just kind of thinking about even modeling it for yourselves. If there can be like a time that the family kind of checks in their cell phones, puts them away, um, you know, consider also that, you know, I know this can be hard when there are different ages of kids at home, but potentially also turning off Wi-Fi at a certain hour if there is potential for sneaking in um, some late night um, internet usage. Eating healthy. And this doesn't necessarily mean like changing up what you eat, but trying to restructure times around eating. Having been more at home, we were more likely to eat at unstructured times. It is shocking how many middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students, I mean, potentially also us adults, do not eat breakfast. Not eating breakfast really can impact the ability to stay focused. And again, like it can mimic, right? Like being hungry in the morning when you think about there's nothing in your stomach to um, digest, you can feel more anxious, you can feel more nauseous. So we wanna make sure that we are restructuring time, uh, the time that we're eating. We can potentially see, especially given how different lunch eating is at school, we could, you know, just checking in with your kids when they come home, like, hey, did you eat lunch? Just maybe even having a conversation and why it might be important to focus on eating lunch. Um, and of course, just kind of trying to have a consistent time to eat dinner as well. Of course, I know how busy we are and there's a lot that we're juggling. It might not always be possible, but if we can at least create an anchor point with consistent breakfast eating that will go a long way. Coping ahead. So thinking about having a plan for stressful situations, I'll talk a little bit more about that, how to do that on the next slide and having fun. So, you know, a lot of kids have been, you know, for those who might've already had a vulnerability to be anxious at school, life or remote life really worked well for them. So now that we're back at school, we are more vulnerable to experiencing more stress or more negative emotions. So trying to plan and put on the calendar some pleasant activities that kids can have to look forward to. So maybe it is thinking about, can we schedule something for the weekend so that at least we have an anchor that to look forward to, right? If we're kind of thinking about like, oh my gosh, I'm back at school. All I have to do is like work and follow rules. And, you know, there's no more fun or I can't just like relax at home. Having something, you know, that for a child to look forward to or consistent family fun activity during the week even can really help reduce their vulnerable vulnerability for stress. My same advice goes for you as parents. So checking in on your own sleep, right, can really impact our ability to, you know, um, plan for our families, our own executive functioning skills, limiting screen time, the information overload can really be burnout inducing and can really impact on how we communicate, um, being mindful of the other biological vulnerabilities around eating, you know, planning activities for yourself. I know this is all easier said than done and can be helpful for thinking about reducing our vulnerabilities to being reactive. So, you know, re thinking about sleep routine, you know, it is a lot easier when kids are younger to feel a little more strict 
with our sleep routine, but I think also being able to model this for your kids as taking a priority um, can really send a helpful message. It is shocking the like the way I like I hear that like middle schoolers are still FaceTiming at like 11 o'clock at night or Snapchatting like in the wee hours of the morning. I'm like, how do you stay, how do you function the next day? So really trying to reinforce um, some routine around sleep. So again, the anchor point being, you know, putting away electronics, you know, making sure that there is, you know, it's not necessarily evidence-based to say that, you know, if we take a bath or a warm shower, you know, that can uh, somehow influence sleep. These aren't newborns. So, you know, but that can also begin to signal, right? It can be a relaxing activity, can signal to the body that, you know, we're ready to go to sleep. Considering a calming activity, you know, before going to sleep, if it is hard for your um, teen to fall asleep, maybe do a joining in and doing it together. So whether that is having a moment to, you know, read as a family or doing a mindfulness exercise together, you can find examples of what a mindfulness exercise can be on YouTube. There are applications such as the Calm app or Headspace. They give nice examples of guided meditations or uh, body scans that we can use to relieve tension in our bodies. And that can really help um, prime the body that it's almost time to go to sleep. Even something as simple as stretching or sitting on the edge of the bed together and for two minutes, closing your eyes and breathing, again, that can go such a long way in terms of unwinding the tension in our body. And of course, I would highly recommend having a consistent lights out. So aiming ballpark range, but trying to be consistent with the communication around what time you know, lights are out not just actual physical lights, but again, considering also turning off Wi-Fi at that time too, if you're consider, if you're worried about any sneaking around um, with Wi-Fi access. Now with coping ahead, it can be, you know, actually sitting down and writing out a plan together or just talking it out verbally. So what we want to, you know, as we talk about feelings, you know, if your teen is coming to you and, you know, feeling stressed out about something, this might indicate that maybe talking about how we can cope ahead of that might be helpful. So we want to know a little bit about what situation might be triggering a strong feeling. Let's say, you know, your teen's coming to you and they're saying, hey, you know, I'm feeling like my friends are ignoring me at recess or at lunch. All right, so we have the situation. Thinking about, all right, so tomorrow when you go to lunch and you know, or recess and you're noticing that your friends are literally, they're walking away from you or, you know, they're not approaching you to talk. In that moment, what might you feel, right? How, what kind of coping skills can you use in that situation? So maybe if they're, body is feeling really uncomfortable. Maybe it is about breathing before they potentially walk up to them and, you know, ask them what's going on. It can even just like taking a break. Maybe it is, you know, going to ask for help and if actually walking them through to imagine the situation, right? What will you say? What might you think? What might you do? We want to imagine and instill kind of essentially like reinforcing bravery and coping effectively through that situation. So talking about what would that look like, right? What can help them feel more confident in dealing with that situation? So we can talk about it, imagine it, and kind of dis uh, discuss it prior to it happening. If it is potentially, if you're noticing like stress coming up in the morning routine, now that we're not just like waking up and signing on to our computers, we're noticing, you know, increased conflict around getting out of bed or, or trying to get them to eat breakfast, any sort of physical in advance can be really helpful. So whether it is picking out the school outfit the night before or discussing, you know, what's for breakfast, what's for lunch the night before. Um, if kids have difficulties, like a lot of anxiety brings up a lot of reassurance seeking and question asking. What time are we getting up? What, you know, how are we going to get to school? How, like, how are we going to study for X, Y, and Z? Coming up also with like a visual schedule can be helpful so that we minimize that question asking, um, you know, whether that is very repetitive and frustrating for you as a parent or stressful for the kid, 
um, laying out the schedule for the day, even, you know, not necessarily for the full week, if that's overwhelming, but any sort of prep can be helpful. Any questions around sleep or coping ahead? Not seeing any in the chat. All right, we'll move on. Tip number four. I mean, I cannot tell you enough how often I hear like, yeah, I, I can't get my kid to do that. Obviously, given also the vulnerability for, of that fight or flight system and, you know, oppositionality being common response, they might not want to change. So when a behavior is challenging to get started, highly recommend increasing reinforcement. So that can be really laying on to the laying on the praising, right? So the things that we can do with our attention as parents to also considering an increase in actual tangible reinforcers. So especially when we are as parents really stressed out ourselves, right? Think about how often we can, our camera lens zooms in on what to nitpick, what isn't going well. You know, the socks on the floor, the toy is not cleaned up, right? The homework not done. All we do is say like focus on what's not getting done. So a great way to reduce our own burnout as parents and to get our kids to start doing more of the things that we want them to do. We really want to focus on praise. Pay attention to what your kids are doing. Make your praise really specific. I mean, I'm talking like giving them a praise for getting out of bed. If they went and brushed their teeth on their own, they need some positive attention for that. Thank you. Oh, I changed it. I went like, thank you for packing your backpack. Thank you for eating breakfast, right? Really simple, small steps towards things that they are doing right, right? Again, this is in the spirit of like, especially if you're noticing a kid being very self-critical and starting to you know, experience a lot of anxiety about the things that they're doing, just focus on what they are doing. Not, there's not a behavior right now that doesn't warrant, you know, praise, you know, think about it. I mean, like, you know, I, I give myself on pat on the back for like wearing jeans nowadays, like kids need a pat on the back for getting out of bed. So if behaviors continue to be challenging and you're, you're noticing that we're stuck at that, like two, three weeks of behaviors being really challenging, consider reasonable and realistic rewards. So is there something that your kid might work towards? Like maybe it is a, you know, a new video game or a new experience or, um, you know, something they might, you know, want to get. It doesn't have to be something grand, can also be an experience. Like maybe it is going out to dinner with you. Consider experiences as well. Think about what makes sense for you as a family and think about like, all right, setting realistic expectations. So if your kid is, you know, not getting out of bed on time for five days straight, you know, maybe asking for perfection first week of, you know, first, second week of school isn't realistic. Can we at least get three days of waking up on time or maybe considering three days getting out of bed with one reminder? If they achieve that weekly goal, you know, on Saturday, we'll go out and get like that special dessert or, you know, we'll consider, I don't know, something again, that's has to be meaningful to your kid. So work with your kid, collaborate, ask what would they be willing to work towards? Um, so think, so that is going to be key in shaping behavior. Don't just expect hundred percent completion right away. Consider lowering, lowering the bar a little bit and reinforce for everything that they do. Try to listen, you know, really, you know, I know that our natural inclination might be like, well, you know, if they're not engaging or if they're not really even working towards their rewards, this might mean that they can't do it or that they don't care or are lazy. This is where consistency is important. Uh, the more that you are consistent with, you know, your attention with those reinforcers, the more likely they are to eventually shape up their behavior. This is incredibly hard for you, right, for them to change behavior and also for your school staff. Any questions about reinforcers? Okay. 
So going back to that inkling that we have as parents to try and fix problems, be problem solvers, make sure that you're assessing before you ever, like start to reassure, provide some optimism or problem solve, right? Very often to us, the solution seems simple. So we, you know, are likely to fall into the pattern of just saying like, all you have to do is, you know, go on your, you know, Google classroom, do this, like give them the solutions or just do X, Y, and Z. That can be very invalidating because the way we present it, it might communicate that it's really easy. Where in fact, given their emotional vulnerabilities right now, everything can potentially feel very overwhelming to them, even something that might seem so simple to us. You know, if they are expressing some concerns, we might also have the potential to say things like, it's going to be fine, you're gonna be okay, you will get used to this. You know, encouraging optimism can be helpful. We want them to think about, you know, what we are all hoping for, which is, you know, a, a more normal summer, or, you know, maybe it is a family vacation that you're considering to take, or maybe your kids might be returning to camp this year. That's kind of like in the future, right? We're still in, um, in April. So, you know, things that, you know, make sense to them right now, you know, maybe we can increase optimism, let's say for the weekend or, you know, honoring that the facts are that the more we do things, the easier it does get, even though it might still be difficult. So that can be something that you can, you know, validate as we try and instill some optimism. So, you know, your middle schoolers are really smart. Um, you know, make sure that you're providing accurate information. So, you know, if they are expressing some concerns, you know, about their safety, about your safety, make sure to ask questions like, what about them makes them scared? What are they envisioning when they close their, when they're going to sleep at night? What does it see? What does, what do they see when it, when it comes to like getting sick? right? What does it look like? What are they worried about? That's where we can actually present the facts to the best of our abilities to help, you know, make sure that they have the most accurate information and they're not potentially, you know, worrying about something irrational. Now the facts are ever changing and we also want to honor that, but you know, whatever we can do in real time can be helpful to them. You know, if you're noticing that they are struggling and they don't want to talk about it, I want you to kind of have, uh, feel free to describe that as like, you know, maybe like I'm noticing that you might be struggling or you might be having a tough time. Would you like any help? Can I support you? Right. Oh, you know, asking them if, if you know, for that permission and welcoming, if they can welcome the support, it might be easier than you enforcing the support. When in doubt, if they keep pushing you away um, and not asking for solutions or not wanting your solutions, just go back to validation. That is the foundation. Um, try to reinforce the behaviors that you do want to see more of. And my tip number six is to take care of yourselves as parents. So practice your own acceptance and self-validation and self-care managing your expectations, right? This might require some adjusting. Uh, trust me, we all want things to feel more normal and the expectations to be the same. And I cannot imagine, you know, the anxiety you all might be feeling if your kid isn't performing, you know, what in the same ways that they used to academically or their social functioning is off. That is very stressful. And what I want you to do as you experience those worry thoughts is to think that you are doing the best you can in this moment. So are your children, so are your partners, so are your teachers, right? And like, we do have to learn new skills. There is a lot of pivoting that's gonna have to happen as we learn more, as we encounter challenges. Pandemic best looks very different from non-pandemic best. Lowering our expectations and validating what's hard right now does not mean that this behavior is going to be acceptable or these expectations are going to be the same in 2022. We will, we are all resilient, right? And I do think that over time, we will be able to shape ourselves out of some of the things that we got used to um, in the past year. Accepting uncertainty is so freaking hard. 
right? The fact that anything can change very quickly is very unsettling and makes us all on edge. So something that kind of just, you know, can help with that is asking yourselves kind of to be mindful of what can I control today, right? What I can't control. Practicing the acceptance of what you don't have control. I like this image of like, it's raining, you know, this, what's not acceptance is like, getting stuck on, I don't like rain. It shouldn't be this way. I wish it wasn't raining, right? Things, this always happens. Um, I hate this and just getting stuck on that versus like, it's raining. Yep, it, this is how the day is gonna go today. So reminding yourselves that this too shall pass, that this sucks and this is incredibly hard and you will get through it. And what you can control and what you can problem solve and thinking about what is realistic, working with your school team, working with your partner, working with any outside providers, working with your kids on some problems um, that, you know, might benefit from some tweaking, right? So think, staying present and focused, taking it one day at a time is what I recommend. Any questions related to what we just went through? or anything specific as it applies to your kid or your situation. Actually, thank you, Magda. Um, I actually just had a parent um, message me directly about a student, their particular student. You know, if you have concerns, please feel free to reach out to me, give me a call tomorrow to discuss um, if you have a situation where you have a child with ongoing um, symptoms or any of these um, difficulties that Magda just talked about. Uh, we can certainly, you know, talk about what supports we have. You know, we have our counselors, we have our psychologists in the school. Um, you know, we have a lot of support and we can also provide some resources. So please reach out either to me or to the school counselor or the psychologist. You know, again, like there are certain things that, you know, we just don't have the answers to, but some organizations that are starting to really promote helpful tips really is the National Center like for Trauma and Response, uh, Trauma Response. So you got the link over here and my colleagues at the Child Mind Institute and they do amazing work. They have like a weekly newsletter that goes out every week and have great social media presence. Um, they have done a lot of reporting on how to support you know, kids across ages um, in this transition you know, and talking about pandemic stress. So highly recommend checking them out. Um, yeah. Uh, your school team is a great support um, and you know it's it's been really tough we are doing our best to try and find solutions and uh, yeah we might not always have all the answers but collaboration is key okay well thank you again so much this is a really great information um, I hope uh, the parents found it helpful and we're recording this and I will make sure to post it if you missed any part of it. Yeah, and I will else. also chat everyone my email if you didn't catch that feel free to reach out to me with um, any questions. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Good night.